Hey everybody, welcome to this year's Summer Knowledge Grab Technology Showcase, where I walk through some of the cool services and tools out there in the Knowledge Graph space. I go through these with an honest review so that you can see what these are all about without necessarily having to go and talk to those salespeople unless you really want to. All right, so the lineup for this year is really exciting. This is the graph technology we're talking about today. And make sure you stick around for this month's showcase because there are a lot of other cool tools that we will be reviewing. So with that said, let's go get started. Who, who am I? So I'm, I'm the founder and CEO of Diffbot. So we operate the world's largest automated knowledge graph. So what our company does is uh, we crawl the web, much like Google and Bing. Besides them, we're the only other US entity that actually does a full commercial web crawl. But we take it a, much, a step much further than Google and Bing. We don't just like you know, index the words on the page and return back a ranked list of links for you to read. We actually read the pages. We use machine learning to automatically uh, classify and structure those pages. And then we use an AI system to curate and build a knowledge graph. We do this every four days on a very large data center we have in the Bay Area where we actually have a copy of the whole web. And then what we do, um, mostly we're a team of machine learning engineers that's working in areas like natural language processing, like knowledge fusion, like record linking, in order to build the entities out of what we call, you know, this the sum total of human knowledge, you know, on the public web. And we build this into an automated knowledge graph. And we work with a lot of, you know, researchers and academic partners as well. Um, and the service that we offer is basically what we call knowledge as a service. So people query us to, uh, people pay us basically to query the Diffbot knowledge graph. So it's an information service, much like a Bloomberg, right? Or a LexisNexis or, or Thomson Reuters. Yeah. And people, we have a query language we've built where people can ask questions to the knowledge graph and then use the structured information that comes back mm -hmm. inside their either consumer or business applications. So what is the, the language called? So it is called um, DQL, the Diffbot query language. <laughs> and okay. we can talk about why um, we have our own language on top of like supported standards as well. But yeah. uh, we yeah. wanted to make it really easy and friendly to use for business users. Um, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's sort of like it has its lineage to the Google search advanced search syntax rather than um, to things like Sparkle or or cipher. And so uh, one thing that I think that makes you so special, and I, I point, whether you know it or not, I point people to you guys all the time <laughs> because I have so many people that come to me and they're like, oh, you know, I love this, this knowledge graph stuff. We've done so much research into it, but where do I start? I don't have the data wow. even to build out my own team. And I'm like, there's there, there's company out there. They, they got data, and yeah. and you can use it. And and even if they just use you as a bootstrap to then you know start to build out their own understanding and skill set, and and understand what kind of data they do want to have in their own personal graph, um, showing it, being able to quickly spin something up and give that, hey, this is actually what a knowledge graph is, and this is what it does for our business is gold like being able to do that is such yeah. a big deal I, I would we're one of the easiest ways to get your own knowledge graph up and running because we can provide that bootstrap set of entities right so if you yep. think about all the ingredients needed to like build up a prototype of a knowledge graph in-house mm -hmm. right of course you need expertise in the team but you also need probably some some database some software yep. some connectors and then like you said uh, data is a key part of any intelligent system what do you seed it with right and because we have, you should view Diffbot as kind of like a global knowledge store, right? Like an mm -hmm. Amazon of knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. It's on our shelves. You have something you can populate it with, and you can enrich yep. internal data that you already have, and you at least have a starting point. And then you can add yep. on the areas of knowledge that are specific, right? This uh, SME, yeah. your particular organization, because it requires um, to do the disambiguation really well at like you know multiple nines of accuracy. You need so much background information about the business, yep. right? Are these two? really the same, you have to spend like an hour of research sometimes to figure yep. out whether these yep. ent business entities are the same, right? Well, one of our earliest customers was a AOL, America Online, and they own multiple um, media properties, right? Like TechCrunch, Huffington Post. Um, I think they own like a, an auto site and stuff. And so they basically acquired all of these different content properties via acquisition. And then they couldn't integrate all the backend CMSs together. It, yeah. um, IT, it was a huge problem for IT. And then when it came for it, they wanted to launch a mobile version of, of AOL's magazine, like on, on cell phones and, and iPads. Yeah. 
they just use Diffbot to basically crawl all of these properties, normalize them into a single ontology with a common tagging system, nice. you know, and they were able to ship that product basically within weeks that had been and roadblocked, I, you know, for months. I love <laughs> that. And if, if those that are watching don't know, I mean, you probably know that integrating data from different databases that are kind of dispersed is, is difficult. I'll put a video up top where Microsoft have ha is having a lot of issues with this right now because they just spent like 68 billion dollars i think it was either it was a, it was yeah. a crazy yeah. amount and that's what they're dealing with right now is how yeah. do you bring all this data together so you can make some meaning out of it and i think that's what you're also saying is something that diffbot can help with which is pretty cool i could just do a, a quick whirlwind of, of the pipeline so basically we yeah. start with the technology to crawl the web which itself mm -hmm. is pretty difficult to crawl and maintain and also render yeah. the web so today's web yeah. is not a document web it's actually Today's web is more like a video game that you play to experience the information. And then we have a technology that classifies the web into a small number of page types. So from mm -hmm. our research and study, we found the internet is so large, but there's like actually about 20 types that can yep. comprise about 98% of the web. I'm talking yep. about like articles, company information, FAQs, yep. discussion threads, yep. uh, image pages, um, profile pages. So yep. there's a small number. And yep. then we have uh, basically the ability to extract each of those uh, types into schema. So like for a product page, you want to know what's the price, the MPN, the SKU. Wow, nice. Like how the dimensions, right? So for an article page, you'd want to know who's the author, when was it published, what is yep. the topic? So yep. there's um, basically machine learning schemas for every of the common types. And then we have all these extractions. Then we have a technology that does record linking. So, hey, these are two are about the same um, yeah. real world thing. So that's yep. a very tough problem too. When you have yep. over 10 billion entities, you can imagine yep. 10 billion square, there's a lot of comparisons you have to make. Then, yep. okay, then you have stuff clustered, but then you, you have, we need to have a process called knowledge fusion, which is how do you resolve like for a given property, what what's the true value of that property? Because the different yes. sources might disagree, yep. right? Yep. So we have algorithms that uh, compute the trustworthiness of every site on the web using mm -hmm. what's the track record of producing facts and the density yeah. of facts, yeah. right? Like we trust Wikipedia innately much more than some blog that was just stood up like last week, right? With, yeah, um, we right. Have, you know, so there's so is that something like, that your your clients can customize too. So if they know certain types of pages or certain uh, you know titles of pages are more trustworthy for their use case, is that something they can they can calibrate? Yeah. So we um, we store all of that metadata throughout the entire pipeline. So mm -hmm. even at the query stage, you can say, okay, I want to query the knowledge, but only from I want to filter what comes back only if it came from like these three origins. Oh, or I want to cool. exclude like this origin. And so yeah. that will be, that, the fact won't appear, come come back. Yeah. It's not from one of those three origins, right? Wow, that's and, so, so nice. <laughs> yeah, so every, our system basically for every fact calculates the probability of truth of that fact and then an estimate of where it came from. So, and it mm -hmm. uses some different methods, but one of them is like ontological reasoning. Like if it's, if there was a page out there on the web that said, Mike Tung lives on the planet, Venus, right, or mm -hmm. Mars. Um, it would that would score very low um, prior, prior probability because you know we know Mike Tung works at Diffbot. Diffbot's in the Bay Area on yep. the planet Earth, and and no yep. one else in the knowledge graph commutes millions of miles from home to work. So right. that would just have a very low confidence, nice. right? So nice. things like I'll try to run you through extraction and natural language and maybe oh. knowledge graph querying. So here's here's for example like um, a uh, product right page you see how it's really messy like on most product pages there's a lot of stuff going on and what if you pass that url into diffbot um, it extracts it into this structured json object and so you see from analyzing that page we know a it is a product page so it's of type product right you we know uh, what category it is it's cameras you know the brand the sku we have the description of the product the price um the, the mpn sku um, inside our JSON, you can see there's other structured facts that we normalize, like, okay, does it have a built-in mic? Does it have Wi-Fi? Um, and we convert those into, into metric because metric is, is superior. Um, and the same thing is you can pass in like an arbitrary, let's say article on the web. And mm -hmm. um, you can see it analyzes that as well. It's thinking right now, it's rendering it. And then you have type article, you have the text of the article, you have the tags, uh, the entities in the article. And um, very cool. All in the one. And we, we even built this uh, sort of fun thing where we applied our NLP to the end, all the articles on the web and we built like a real time sanctions tracker. So this is this is the most comprehensive list of all sanctions announcements. You can see there's like over wow, very cool. 13. But for each 
a company you've identified that announced sanctions, we have a, a to the exact citation of the quotes automatically produced by the system where that sanctions announced. So that's as mm -hmm. the data provenance I was mentioning. Here are the primary sources of that inference, right? So this is all automatically built by basically someone on our marketing team in a matter of a few hours by just pointing wow. towards this particular kind of fact extraction. So we, we basically have a system and we have a paper released about it. We've also benchmarked it against the NL systems of all the major AI labs. Very cool. It, it, um, so we, and we have an open data set called KnowledgeNet that the academic community uses to, to benchmark it as well. Um, but um, what it does is it basically takes text and it, it solves a problem of what's called AKBC, automatic knowledge, automatic knowledge based construction. Mm -hmm. um, you can see here a benchmark against other commercial systems um, and you can try it with a non gated uh, live demo right on the site. So if you pass in some text like this, like mm -hmm. random web, you can see mm -hmm. that's the input, and this is the output. It automatically builds a knowledge graph, and you can see that's the amazing. Input. You can see I... the facts, and you can see open facts, non-ontological facts extracted. It's not. It's a living, interactive interface too. So the stakeholder yeah. can plug in, you know, their own text and try it out and see how. And, it really and works. that's where you get that that um, that connection that the stakeholders can really resonate with the examples that you are putting together. And I do want to also, before you move on, highlight your, your having an open data set that academics can measure against. I think that actually shows a lot of uh, promise and, uh, you know, stability in, in your company that you're like, yep, we have nothing to, to hide. You, you figure out like what this looks like for your use case. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a really powerful statement, I think. Well, it, and we, we did that because um, before that, we released that our, our own data set. Um, the best, the most popular data set for this problem of automated knowledge based construction from text was a data set from 2013 called TAC KBP. And it was, you know, uh, organized by TAC, which is under NIST, you know, National Institute of, yep. of Standards. And um, it was just, we had already kind of maxed out and gotten the best possible performance on that data set. And it yep. was already too high. So we just um, released our own much harder data yep. set. Um, yep. Cool. So you can see here, here's the knowledge graph that's built right from the text. Here are the entities. For mm -hmm. each entity, it's, it has its linkage to the entry in our knowledge graph for that entity. So like mm -hmm. this Mike Tongue is not just Mike Tongue, the text, but it's yep. linked to the Stanford University. It's linking to the, the entity for Stanford University. So and are you using some linked data there? So like I know that there's like wiki data that's connected to, you know, Stanford yeah. University. So you you have all of that? So, uh, so here you can see, for example, the Stanford entity, right? And you can see, okay, it has a bunch of subsidiaries. It has the key people uh, in the departments, the alumni, the students, mm -hmm. technology Stanford uses, uh, images of Stanford, uh, similar institutions, mm -hmm. all of the articles on the web that uh, are about this entity. Mm -hmm. and, and it also, if you look at the underlying JSON, it's going to get a little geeky here, but you can <laughs> see all of like the different forms of Stanford we were able to find on the web because it's a multilingual yep. knowledge graph. Yep. You're also able to see um, and hear all of like the primary sources on the web uh, that we're able oh, to find. Oh, great. To it. That's awesome. And, and you mentioned like Wikipedia and Wikidata, right? So Wikidata, it was able to find a linkage to on the web because Wikidata is also on the public web. So as we're yep. calling the web, we're able to that's great. Uh, resolve it to other namespaces, right? Like and that's really helpful for anyone doing mapping with mm -hmm. data that isn't necessarily on the open web, that you have that connection, that it, this connects to the wiki article or whatever it is that that public URL is. And then yeah. if you have that mapped in your back end, you have that automatic mapping that then can, can transpire. Yeah, so we, we have, here's, you know, um, here's my profile, um, and then we also have, if you have the entity type, we also have the salience, which is like how relevant is this entity to this, mm. this, text, this bit of news. We also have what's called the entity directed sentiment. So mm -hmm. like not just like an overall sentiment of the document, which it can't, isn't that actionable sometimes, but like, yeah. okay, I'm bullish on Bitcoin, for example, but bearish on the US dollar. That's a phrase where you could be positive and negative about something in the same mm -hmm. sentence. Right. Or mm -hmm. I really love um, the ambiance, but I, I hated this, the service at a restaurant, for example, yeah. is something you can. It, it, this so is where happens. does this say? So I'm, I'm more familiar with sentiment analysis, but where mm -hmm. does the salience come from? Is that like just on the popular web where how much that's being mentioned or where does uh, what goes into that? This is um, 
not an overall salience, but how salient is it to this particular text? I right? see. I gotcha. It's, okay, so it's the emphasis of, of yes, the text. Right. right. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, is it just like something that's mentioned kind of in passing, or is this like central to like what's the actual bit of news or the actual? Nice. Yeah. Um, you can also see, okay, these are the triples, the, the actual facts, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see here, um, you know, right. my tongue, diffbot are both linked entities, there's a relationship, and there's fact qualification. So uh, I mentioned temporality. So I'm is current mm -hmm. the founder and CEO, and these are all qualify my, my employment there. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, uh, I used to work at Microsoft, right? So mm -hmm. you can see in terms of what it's highlighting in the text, in a previous life, he, and the he we know is Mike Tung because of pronoun mm -hmm. co-reference resolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the grad student in the Stanford AL lab and a software engineer at eBay, Yahoo, and Microsoft. Because, because it's past tense, we know that it's not current, which obviously in a business application, you'd want to know whether it's yep. current tense yep. or past, right? And yep. that it's qualified, right? And, and a lot of this data is what we use for question answer in, in search as well, which is great. Yeah, because knowledge changes over time, which a lot of people don't realize is that mm -hmm. uh, something is true or not true but when and where yeah <laughs> or not yep. true <laughs> yeah right yeah and this yeah. is where i think you can also show where um it's not totally i know you're you're more on the <laughs> not saying property graph versus rdf but rdf has a hard time unless you're using like rdf star or sparkle star for yeah, some of this like star. past life stuff but this showcases why that is so incredibly important to make sure, sure that you are accounting for yeah, you need, or you need basically like a quad structure, right, to, yeah. to add an additional piece of information to that. Yep. Trip. yep. Uh, and then you can have uh, open facts. Uh, you can also provide custom facts, which I won't demo because this is more custom, but you can basically yeah. uh, define your own fact, give just a few positive or negative training examples. Yeah. Here's an example like academic background in AI. So it was able to even though this is not an ontological property, it's able to infer that from he was a grad student in Stanford AI. That's great. So background in AI. That really helps uh, with scalability. Another huge differentiator, uh, in our opinion, between our knowledge graph and, and, and like Google and Bing's is we are not building like a different index of each language on the web. So if, you're, mm -hmm. if you search, if, if you're a French speaker and you use Google.fr, you're only searching the French documents on the web. You're not searching the whole all the world's knowledge, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What we do is we read the whole web, so all the world's knowledge, and then you see here, like for example, Chinese text, and the output is not in Chinese. The output is still in the same format, machine readable entities and triple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you can pass in, you know, uh, other languages. Like I'm not, um, you know, I don't speak Arabic, but I can pass in Arabic to the NL API and it can still build a knowledge graph out of That's the great. So yeah. I want to, there's a couple of ways you can query the knowledge graph. One is you can build your query in the diffbot query language. Mm -hmm. I'll show you the harder way than the easier way. So okay. can, maybe how the easier way is so much easier, but in the harder way, you basically can say, okay, give me all organizations um, that um, are named Amplify Partners. That's how you would ask that question. And you mm -hmm. can see that's mm -hmm. not a unique name, but there's many that have that in yeah. there. This, this one was the top one that I just mm -hmm. saw in Menlo Park. And they're investors. So let's say I want to find organizations that they have raised investment. And you see the autocomplete is trying to help me, but yeah. I'm, I'm still failing to, to type. But uh, so investors.name. So it's, it's autocompleting using our ontology. Nice. And so these are, I'm asking this question give me all organizations that have raised investment from Amplify Partners, right? And so you can see that returns back uh, 81 results. And I can Let's say I want to view them in a graph. So I, don't, I just want to view that subset of the knowledge mm -hmm. graph. So I can look at, okay, these are the companies that have from Amplify. And um, I can see some patterns here, like here's Amplify. But then mm -hmm. I can see there's some cluster around New York and, and they tend to be mainly software companies, right? Mm -hmm. um, I see our logo here <laughs> and I see yeah. uh, Mountain View. Um, and you can also see Sequoia here. They they don't have a direct edge to Amplify, but it looks like they're co-invested in some of the, mm -hmm. the companies that they're in, right? So the, this is where a graph, uh, people sometimes ask me like, when do you use a graph visualization? This is a good one, reason. One reason is to find, um, uh, these visual patterns are so apparent, right? To our visual cortex, yep. these these yep. kind of patterns, you don't see in a table, right? Because you yep. only see them, you discover them once you lay it out in this way. Yep, a hundred, I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. 
This is one of the biggest reasons that, you know, if you're trying to look for fraud detection, <laughs> who yeah. invests in who and who's taking money from who, this is a great way to look yeah, at it. Yeah, because if you knew exactly like the question to ask, you wouldn't need to do anything. You'd be done. You don't, you don't even right. need an analyst. But the, the right. problem is you are trying to explore to find some anomaly, something that doesn't yep. ma match like a, a typical pattern, right? Yep. So that's, this is where actually these, these visualizations are very helpful. Um, so, so yeah, you can, um, there, you can view things in a table, you can view them on a map. You can also search by criteria. So let's say, let's now go to the visual query builder. So let me reset my query and let's say, okay, give me all products that are, um, let's say brand Nike that are, um, let's say the, they, the name, it's for a shoe. So uh, here's, these are basically Nike shoes, right? So here's like all of Nike's SKUs across the web. Yep. I can, um, this is very useful if you're Nike for finding people that are selling fraudulent Nikes <laughs> <'Cause it's laughs> across the whole web, making sure no one's yeah. violating like MSRP yeah. and yeah. stuff. But it can also do stuff like, okay, I want to understand, okay, that this shoe is very popular among people that are practicing martial arts, right? So you want to get feedback on products you release and what yeah. people like and not like about it. So well, this or if you're uh, trying to compete with Nike, um, what what does their price look like? What what does their um, portfolio look like? I think there's some competitive advantages here too. Yeah, 